Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of October 21st, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the project's page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you can also follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss whether the governor's new focus on data centers is a last minute Hail Mary in support of the AKLNG project. And if so, how we react to that. Second, we discuss Larry Persley's most recent column and why we think it's hypocritical in not applying a similar standard to the state budget. And third, we discuss some interesting developments in both the Kenai and Fairbanks legislative races and why we think they are significant. And now, let's join Michael. All right, Brad. Well, let's uh, let's get into it. The weekly top three. We've got some deep uh, deep dive stuff to get into today. Uh, the first one, uh, first of the weekly top three, we need to talk about the AKLNG and data centers, which have been talked about for years. But uh, give me uh, give me your 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 take on this whole thing. Well, Governor Dunn, there's an article in the ADN and elsewhere. It was written by uh, Nat Hertz of uh, Northern Journal and repeated in a number of publications. Uh, and the title of the of the article is Data Centers Face Growing Opposition Outside Governor Mike Dunleavy Wants Them in Alaska. And the governor's pitch is we have everything the data centers would need. We have water, which is uh, fresh water, which is true. We have land, which is certainly true. And we have energy in the form of natural gas. And the governor, of course, makes the tie between the natural gas pipeline, the AKLNG project, and the data centers, and, and is now starting to talk about the data centers as being you know, the, the way that we're going to anchor uh, the, uh, the gas pipeline. In fact, the governor says somewhere in this article, uh, all we need is one anchor. Uh, and uh, and 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 we and we be, be able to put the whole thing together. And he's talking about the data center as a data center as being an anchor. Let's put this in context for a second. Last April, the uh, legislature was threatening to close down the AKLNG project by uh, cutting off funding. And in response to that, and sort of in desperation, uh, the the uh, chairman of the AGDC and the vice chairman sent a letter to Senator Click Bishop of Senate of the Senate Resources Committee on April 22nd, 2024, and that said this, we have instructed AGDC staff to secure commitments to initiate feed, the remaining engineering cost estimating and construction preparation needed before making a final investment decision on the pipeline phase, no later than the end of this year. If AGDC fails to secure funding for the entire project or for the initial phase of the project by that date, we have instructed AGDC staff to initiate the work required to shut down and either sell the Alaska LNG project assets or put them into storage if there's insufficient value realized for the state of Alaska. They themselves, in response to the threat of legislative shutdown last year, they themselves put an end of year date on the project. And if the project isn't funded by that point uh, to, to start, the, the, start the shutdown. So the clock's ticking. We're in late October. We're about to be in November. The clock, the the, the date uh, is the end of the year and the clock's ticking. 
in that context, all of a sudden, the governor Dunleavy starts talking about data centers. And, and the question it, the question to me that immediately came to mind is, is this a last second Hail Mary or a last minute Hail Mary uh, to try to create an excuse to keep AGDC going uh, when, uh, when, it's, when by its own words, it's on track to start shutting down uh, at the end of the year? The thing that, that particularly got my attention is the governor's statement that they just needed an anchor tenant. The project just needed an anchor tenant or so. Uh, and it was going to go, and it was a go, and the anchor tenant would be data centers. So I've looked a little bit into data centers and, and their gas consumption and, and, and their requirements, um, and it isn't an anchor tenant or so. It's a lot of anchor tenants that the governor, that the, that the project would, would need to come up with. Currently in the, in, in the world, data centers are about 100 megawatt uh, projects. And, and that translates into about mm, 25 or so million cubic feet of gas. To put that in context, to make the, 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 even the in-state pi pipeline project economic, you need about 150 million a day of additional demand. So one data center sized as, as most are sized or as, as the large ones are sized in the lower 48, 48 currently would give you about, you know, 20, about 35 or so or 25 or so million cubic feet a day of, of demand. Some new data centers called hypercenters are, are being sized up to 150 million cubic or 100, 150 uh, megawatts. And that's about 30, 35, 40 uh, million cubic feet a day of demand. But that's the average in the lower 48. The governor is correct that one of the advantages of Alaska is that it's cold. And so data centers would not, uh, data centers would find the, data centers find the cold more advantageous because a lot of the, a lot of the energy that the data centers uh, use is to, is for cooling equipment to keep all of the, all of the uh, computers cool uh, or else they would, you know, burn out and all sorts of bad things. Right. So Essentially it's, air conditioning, right. Air conditioning right. for the computers, right. So Alaska, one of Alaska's advantages is that it's cold. And so they wouldn't need as much cooling. But that also translates into less gas, less energy. Uh, and it's, significant, it's a significant amount of less energy. So, for example, 100 megawatt power in Alaska, 100, 100 megawatt unit in Alaska, would translate into about 20 million cubic feet a day. Keep in mind that the target to make the pipeline economic is 150. Would be about 20 million cubic feet or about 20 million cubic feet a day. 150 megawatt unit, and there aren't that many of those, but they're beginning to, to come on the market. 150 megawatt unit would be about 30 million cubic feet a day. Some people say, oh, well, they're gonna, these things are going to be put in clusters. And there is a couple of examples of that out in the east. Uh, the, the deal that Microsoft just announced uh, to put Three Mile Island, the Three Mile Island nuclear unit back in, back in power, uh, back in operation is is one of those another one is a amazon uh, uh, web services announced a deal with another power plant uh, a nuclear power plant in pennsylvania uh, to build a data centers around that and they're going to cluster a lot of data centers around those power plants but those are existing already permitted already operational three mile island has to go back into operation but but it's the unit that they're talking about is, is the unit that wasn't damaged. It just got closed down because its sister unit had problems, putting those back, putting that back in operation. And, and so they're existing already power outing uh, uh, units. And they're just talking about clustering data centers around those units. Alaska would be entirely different. Alaska would be a gas fired new grassroots greenfield unit that would require permits and would require uh, uh, all of this, all of the things that go along with getting a power generation uh, system set up. So it's 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 not one anchor tenant that we're talking about. If we're talking, even if we're talking about 150 watt, 150 megawatt uh, data centers, we're talking about only about 30 million cubic feet of data of gas, and we're talking about five of those to get the to get the the, the power up to. Uh, uh, to get the the volume up to the level required to make the uh, the AKLNG project uh, economic, 
And so you got to be a little skeptical about that. You got to think back to, let's see, what's the last big thing the governor announced? Oh, yeah, carbon credits <laughs> and how that was going to solve the budget crisis for you know the next decade and beyond by, by selling all these carbon credits and by creating the, the storage unit. You got to think back to these to the governor's announcements and when he projects big things, what uh, what happens with them? I think, in all honesty, you know, maybe maybe we do ultimately get data centers up here. Maybe they are ultimately of a size that uh, that uh, 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 would 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 keep would make the pipeline economic. But you got to you got to question whether whether that's whether that's real. And I think. Re frankly, what we ought to do is keep on track, stay on track with what uh, the AGDC itself said in the letter to Senator Bishop last April. We have instructed AGDC staff to secure commitments if they can't. Uh, we have instructed staff to initiate the work required to shut down and either sell the LNG project assets or put them into storage. That doesn't mean we destroy the value, doesn't mean we destroy the work that's been done, doesn't mean we throw away the permits that we don't terminate the permits. We don't do any of that. We just stop spending money on it for a while until somebody comes along with real money and says, oh, this is the project. This is a project that's real. Here's real money. I'm going to invest in it and uh, and go forward from there. Right. Throwing out this Hail, Mel Hail Mary with two months left to go in their self-imposed deadline, I think I think is a Hail Mary. And I think it's one that uh, we should just let land uh, flat in the end zone. Well, at some point, you have to start asking questions about the uh, the gas line uh, authority because um, we've been we've been pumping money into it at an incredible rate and seen basically zero return. We have gotten some permits, we have gotten some certain things going on, but at some point, we have to realize that it's not the government pushing things; it's the market. The market is what creates the demand. Government can't really create that demand on its own. And instead, all it's doing, as you said, is spinning the wheels and just spending money on it. In fact, this opinion piece or this uh, this article that you talked about where they acknowledge that they want to close down the LNG project, this article was written back in May. And I had to laugh because when the article came up, I had already highlighted back in May uh, and the highlights remain on my page. When I, after I highlight something, I got an app that does that, that allows me to highlight something. I had to laugh because halfway down the page, it says the gas line agency is home to some of the highest paid executives in Alaska, including the top earner, Frank Richards, the agency's president, who makes $389,000 a year plus retirement benefits and health care and all the other stuff. So 300. So, I mean, it was just one of those things that just jumped out at me. You know, we've been doing this for years and basically creating a jobs program for people who are basically sitting around twiddling their thumbs until the market demand or the economics come into alignment. And that's part of the problem is we're trying to force something that can only come from market forces. It can't really come from the state side. Yeah, exactly. And, and I don't think we lose much Frankly, if we just put it into into storage for a while, put the project into storage for a while, people know it's there. The governor's office can still tout it. If 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 data center, if if the market for data centers is evolving in a way that would make Alaska attractive, uh, then you know you can bring it out of storage, revive it, do whatever 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 you need to with it. It's not like it's going to deteriorate while it's in storage. Yes, the time is running on the permits. Uh, and and the permits may need to be renewed when you come out of it. And but you're not. But if the market isn't there now, you're not going to. You're you're not shortening that time frame on the permits at any. It, I mean, the time's going to continue to run even if you continue spinning your wheels waiting on it. So, I think we've gotten to a point that if the market wants it, the market knows it's there. If the data, if there's data centers out there that want to invest in it, data center de data center developers that want to invest in it, they know it's there. Uh, and they can uh, and they can pursue it. Right. I thought this was interesting because the one that, you know, the 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 data center idea that makes the most sense is clustering the data centers around areas of the North Slope where they don't have to transit the gas anywhere. And they can either just use existing power plants or build up new power plants right there on the field and utilize it right there because it stays the coldest. It's got the most wide open land. It's got and so it doesn't really, it was ironic that it doesn't really help the rest of the state per se, but if you were going to do it, that would be the place to, to really, to do it in, uh, in that regard. 
Oh, but it wouldn't anchor the pipeline that way, Michael. I mean, we want to we want to kill a number of a number of rabbits while we're going, right? I mean, we want to we want to just smash another number of things. So I so that's I mean that's the context that the governor's talking about it in, and I'm sure the governor's aware of the of the of the self uh, uh, created uh, end of year uh, deadline on the project, and I it just it yes North Slope would make sense. You've got some some issues with uh, having enough bandwidth up there to to be able to actually utilize uh utilize data centers you you'd uh, you'd build up there you'd have to build i mean sort of the reverse of that is you'd have to build a whole lot of bandwidth into the north slope for uh for for data centers to actually you know be able to enter the data center market uh from from that location uh but the governor you know is seeing you know oh boy i can I, you know i can talk about this now i talked about Let's see, I talked about uh, 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 climate uh, uh, credits a couple of years ago. That got me through a session. Maybe I can talk about this, and this will get me through a session. And uh, and you know, I can promote this and say we need to keep the AKLNG line going. And uh, and you know, this is out there on and and I'll and I'll get to the end of the session, and people won't have figured it out yet. Well, it's not that hard to figure it out. This is this may not be well. Yeah, it's about as pie in the sky as the as the as the climate credits uh, uh, project was. Well, I mean, we'd all love to see it. We have all the things that are out there, but again, the metrics and the economics of it are just you know not working out quite yet. Uh, and uh, again, the one the most feasible of the feasible ideas means that it wouldn't be the anchor tenant that he wants it to be. I mean, it, essentially, there'd have to be five clustered data centers to be able to be the anchor tenant size based on the numbers you just threw out there. Right. Would that be about right? Yeah, that'd be about right. And, and it'd be maybe six or seven because because the cold <laughs> because the cold is helping you. Uh, reduce your costs in terms of energy costs, but it's also reducing gas demand that makes that makes things econo economic from you know at least the pipelines in. So right, right. Uh, it's it's sort it's sort of working against itself as it goes. Well, we'll have to see. Uh, we'll have to see where that goes. I mean, there's so many great things that we could do in this state if only the economics worked out for us. I mean, and that's the thing. We can't have this pie in the sky kind of idea of this would be great and that would be great and this would be great okay well then how do we make the how do we make the economics work uh if you can't do that sure it'd be great to do all those things but if the private sector is not willing to invest the state can't do it all there's just not enough money it'd be great to grow barley <laughs> in alaska it'd be great to go right. food, food secure uh not bring in any of our food it'd be great to do a lot of things but but the economics aren't there. I got I I, I wrote a note about this issue uh, on my Substack page, and I got pushback from a guy who said, "Oh, the state of Alaska is so short-sighted. If it just had this pipeline, it could develop more North, North Slope gas. It'd have, a, yeah, right. If Alaska just built a forty billion dollar pipeline, put your money where your mouth is. You know, step up, step up, and and build a pipeline, and then all these great things happen. They don't happen for free, and everybody wants." you know, wants to ride on the state's court coattails. They want the state to build it for them. They want to take PFDs out of, out of you know, Jesse Sumner's bill to cut the PFD permanently in order to pay off a pipeline. They want middle and lower income Alaskan families to pay for it. They don't want to pay for it themselves. I, right. I'm just saying we need to, we need people who are willing to pay for things themselves. And if they, if they aren't willing to do so, we need to move on to the next thing. It's always the guy behind the tree that needs to pay, right? That's what it's always. They always the guy behind the knee, the, the 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 tree that needs to pay. Not us, but him. All right, the weekly top three continues. We're on to number two today. And this seems like a perennial topic that we're always talking about. And that is the hypocrisy of Larry Persilli, who is uh, you know, he's a he's a uh he's a policy wonk, he's worked for the government at all different kinds of levels. Um, he publishes a newspaper down in the Southeast. He does all the, but the thing is, is that he's always coming back and he always, it's always interesting to watch because at some point he always does something that is, or says something or writes something that is fairly hypocritical of everything else that he's written previously. Brad, I'll let you go to this. Well, you know, I've, I've sort of become immunized against, against Larry's columns. I mean, I, I, a lot, a lot of them go by and say, oh gosh, here we go again. Uh, and it takes a lot anymore for one of those columns to stand out and just, you know, make me cover my 
face in my hands and just you know keep shaking my head. This one did it. Uh, it's a column that was uh, posted this week. It's in various other papers around the state as well, uh, around the state as well. But it was posted this week in the ADN, and it's an opinion piece. Uh, the and the title of it is "The Problem with Politicians' Tax-Free Pop Promises." And there's a picture of Kamala Harris and uh, and President Trump. Uh, underneath the former President Trump, underneath the uh, underneath the headline, and indeed the entire article is about uh, the tax-free promises being made both on the Trump side, um, uh, the, the the you know the reductions in income tax he's talking about, repealing the tax on tips, repealing the tax on Social Security benefits, uh, uh, spending a lot, and uh, additional new spending that he's proposed, and. And and all of those sorts of all of those sorts of uh, promises personally he's got, and then he takes on the the Harris promises, um, and then he says in a, in a sense he says, but details matter, especially when it comes to government spending or lack of government revenue. Uh, it all adds up to the same. The Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, a respected nonpartisan think tank that advocates for reduced federal deficits, added up all the Trump tax cutting promises and. And came to a number. They did the same thing with the Harris promises and came up to a number. And and personally says that's that's just bad. We can't continue to have politicians who talk about and 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 you know talking heads who talk about who advocate for tax cuts here and tax cuts for there and tax cuts there, without without offsetting revenues that pay for it. It was an issue that you and I talked about uh, just last week. The irony and the hypocrisy of it is is this. We're doing exactly the same thing at the state level. And personally has been a big supporter of those spending programs at the state level. Spending for, increased spending for K through 12, increased spending for defined benefits, increased spending for uh, the university, increased spending for this program, that program, increased spending for childcare, just you know, program after program after program of increased spending with no talk on personally's, on personally's side and no talk on the advocate side of, ta- of of what that's doing on taxes. Personally, personally, just ignores the issue, and in fact goes out and says that it's okay to uh, continue PFD cuts to pay for these things. Um, we're just taking it out of the pockets. You know, we're just taking it out of another government program. Well, it isn't another government program. It's a program that distributes part of the wealth of the state, the common wealth, commonly owned, commonly held wealth of the state. Directly to citizens, and and it isn't it isn't a government payout. It's a distribution of what the citizens own already uh, uh, into their pockets. And taking it is, if you don't want to call it taxes, taking it is certainly reducing their income, uh, which is the same thing uh, as taxes by diverting that money uh, into government. Personally, he's talking all about you know all about additional government spending at the state level, but never talks about equitably paying for it through taxes, equitable taxes that have all Alaskans contributing as opposed to just focusing the burden on the backs of middle and and lower income Alaska families. And I find it just hugely hypocritical, almost to the point of just laughing about it, when he takes an entire column to talk about, you know, additional government uh, tax tax proposals that are coming from the Trump campaign and the Harris campaign and how how horrible they are and additional spending coming from both campaigns and how horrible that is and and the increased deficits it would take that's taking from future uh, future uh, citizens of the United States taking money out of their pocket to 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 bear the debt burden well the same thing is going on at in Alaska we have people talking about this additional spending increasing the tax burden on middle and lower income Alaska families through uh through uh, uh through PFD cuts and and not recognizing that and 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 couching it in words that it's well this additional spending on K through 12 or this additional spending on child care or this additional spending on the defined benefits program that's all tax free you wouldn't have to pay taxes for that that's all free uh government services all we have to do is cut pfds all we right. have to do is, right. is is take money out of out of middle and lower income alaska families if he's going to call if he's going to decry what's going on at the federal level uh, as being, you know, a gamesmanship and as being unsubstantial, uh, un, un, uh, uh, fulfillable, uh, leading to additional deficits, then deficits, then he should decry the same thing, the tax-free claims 
the spending without burdening you claims that are go that's going on at the state level and call a spade a spade and say, look, this is coming at the expense of PFDs. When you take PFDs out of people's pockets, it hits middle and lower income it's a tax. Uh, as uh, as as Matt Berman has called it, ICER Professor Matt Berman has called it, it's a tax on middle and lower income Alaska families. And if we're going to spend on this stuff, we need to be more equitable. Yeah, no, I think, look, this whole thing with Persilli is, uh, I mean, I actually think that he's kind of um, stayed steady on this. I don't know. It, it, it is hypocrisy in a way, but literally, if you look at the theme through all of his articles, the all of his articles are there needs to be more spending. That I mean, that really he's has stayed true on one thing. There needs to, he's basically complaining that both Trump and Harris are basically saying, well, they'll cut some taxes and they'll reduce some spending and they'll do this. And we shouldn't do that. Essentially, kind of his key component there is that government spending is a must in all areas. And we can't just give it up. We can't just, you know, uh, uh, we've got to keep we should be no cuts. That's kind of what he's looking at here. Um, so it's kind of hypocritical, but at the same time, he's kind of stayed true to form, which is essentially all that government spending is good. That's kind of what it comes down to. That is uh, consistent, but it's the pay for side. It's the revenue side yeah. that I, that I, that, that where the hypocrisy emerges on the revenue side, he's decrying the lack of equitable revenue to pay for it. I mean, government's paying for everything. It, it's paying it through the issuance of bonds, taxes on future generations. Government, the federal government's paying for everything, but he's decrying the fact that we aren't doing this. We aren't doing it equitably. That we're reducing, uh, re reducing the burden on uh, on current uh, uh, U.S. citizens and pushing it off to, to future uh, U.S. citizens, and and that that's not equitable. And we should be paying for it uh, as we as we do it. On the state side, it's a little bit different. We are paying for it. I mean, we're using PFD cuts. We're not we're, we're not we're not doing anything else, uh, but but he is um, uh, talking about it in a way that that the equity on the state side, he's not he's not as focused on that. He's not focusing on that like he's focusing on the equity on the uh, on the federal side. Right. No. And, and of course, the bigger problem here is, is that the more you do it on the federal side, you have a much greater danger. If we do it on the Alaskan side, what it's going to lead to essentially is more government spending and eventually the death of the PFD and more taxes. But if they keep doing it on the national side, um, now we've got a full on full blown crisis going on uh, because we just, we won't be able to, we won't be able to, uh, uh, you know, remain the world reserve currency and it'll cause, I mean, it could cause some kind of something catastrophic, um, but we've got to, you know, we've got to basically rein in the spending somehow. And how else are we supposed to do it, Brad, at that point? How else are we supposed to rein in the spending on either the national or the state side? You've seen the CFRB stuff. I mean, they've they they have looked at this, um, you know, they have looked at this extensively, and they're not they're not happy with any of the proposals out there. What do we do? No, I, but Michael, I think the answer is is always pay as you go, right? If you want to buy something. Uh, then you ought to pay for it as you go, and you ought to pay for it equi equitably. All of the people that are benefiting from it, all of the people that are that are that are getting some benefits from it, ought to pay ought to pay a share of it. And and on the federal side, if we're going to spend this much, we ought to be, uh, uh, frankly, raising more revenues in some fashion in order to pay for all this stuff. What that would do is focus people on the fact that wait, we're spending a lot, uh, and you want to take that out of my pocket. It would, yeah, I think it would lead to a revolt and it would lead to lower spending because people would face up to the fact of, of the costs of what, of what they're buying. On the state side, the same way. We need to have an equitable, we need to pay as we go. It needs to be equitable. And if every had, everybody had to contribute to it uh, on an equitable basis, the top 20%, the, uh, the non-resident industries, the tourist industries, fish industries, and the oil industry who also would, would need to contribute to the additional spending, they would revolt. They would say, no, we're not going to pay for this additional amount. Stop spending. If you're going to make us pay for it, as opposed to pushing it off on somebody else, which we're fine with, but if you're going to make for us pay for it, uh, then, uh, then, then we need to, uh, then we, then we need to, to, to lower the spending. I guess the same, th same thing is true on, on both sides. Personally, personally complains about the fact we're not getting revenue, the pay as you go on the federal side, uh, and that we need to, you know, have more revenue in order to, in order to deal with the spending. Yes, maybe increase spending, but have more revenue to deal with that, 
with that with that spending on the federal side, but then he just ignores it on the state side. He ignores the equitable revenue issue uh, on the state side and and continues to argue for uh, for additional spending tax free, but it's only tax free to the top twenty percent to non residents and to the and to the oil companies, and uh, and and it's not but it's not tax free to the rest of the other eighty percent of Alaska families. Right. No, I mean, that's part of the whole thing. When you live on the credit card, it becomes easy and easy until the bill comes due. And when the bill comes due big time, uh, as we're going to see on the national level and on the state level here in the next 10 years, it's going to create some real problems. I just had to laugh because for me, Brad, that seemed to be the theme throughout everything that Priscilla has written is that government spending is good. I mean, that's just kind of like, oh, I just go, oh, I want it all, you know. Uh, he may complain about how this is being funded or that's being funded, but the bottom line is he wants that government spend no matter what. And that's that. I mean, at least he's consistent, I guess, on that component. Yeah. But this article is focused more on the revenue side that, yeah. that we need, yeah. that the revenue side needs to match the, or at least come close to matching uh, the spending side and the revenue side needs to be equitable. We should, we should stop kicking the can to future generations, taxing future generations, by by running uh, running even higher deficits, and, but he's not. The, the, there's not that theme. He does. He never touches that theme on the state side. The state side is always, oh, we can just do it through more PFD cuts, uh, as opposed to we need to address um, uh, revenues equitably on the state side as well. In, in in a sense, I mean, the issues are the same at the federal level and the state level. It's just who's getting hit is different. Right. At the right. federal level. The federal level, the gaps being closed by future generations, right? We're just kicking the can, kicking the can down the road, and taxing future generations by by running up uh, debt. At the state level, we're not doing that. The, the 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 can isn't getting kicked down the road to future generations. Instead, we're kicking the can to middle and lower income Alaska families by using by using PFD right. cuts. Concepts the same. Run huge deficits. Yeah. The amount of the deficit at the federal level is the same as the amount of the deficit at, on a percentage basis as the amount of the deficit at the state level, it's just who is getting hit with the deficit uh, that's, right. that's different. Well, and it just shows in his mind that uh, it, it just, it solidifies in his mind that the PFD is government money, because if it was the people's money, he'd feel something totally different, but he hundred percent believes and has swallowed the Kool-Aid that that's all government money. So it's free and clear to take, and it doesn't matter. Um, and, and that, I think that just, this just proves that out. Um, Fat Ray said, I thought for sure PFD cuts were a tax, didn't realize they only applied to one demographic and not to everyone. Well, it is a tax and it's a tax on everyone, but we're talking about, Brad, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're talking about the regressiveness of it. It affects the demographic that it affects is the lowest income earners in the state harder than anybody else. Well, and middle income. I mean, so the way to look at it is look at what the average tax rate is or what the flat tax rate would be. Uh, if everyone paid equitably as a as a share of of income, which is how taxes are are calculated, uh, and and look at what the flat tax rate would be, and then look at who's paying below that tax rate, who's who's getting off with not paying the average tax rate, and who's paying above that tax rate, um, and it's the top twenty percent that's getting off with with paying significantly below the average tax rate, and it's being funded that gap between the average tax rate and the and what the top 20% are paying is being funded by excess taxes, excess burden on middle and lower income Alaska families. They're in excess, essence subsidizing the top 20% by paying more so the top 20% get off with paying less. Yeah, so it is a tax, although Randy will say it's not. It is a tax uh, because because uh, everybody is paying it, but it's the impact of that tax that we've been talking about here on this as uh, well. Um, let me go through here. Let's see. Sp Barbara says, speaking of federal deficit, it took a sharp uptick in the last three weeks. I mean, you know, yeah. What do you think is going to happen? They just what? They got one more continuing resolution. Uh, does it take it to the end of this month or did they take it to the end of the year now? I can't remember the last one. They, they just keep shuffling uh, the deck forward. It's, it's into December. Into uh, December. Take it yeah. After the election. Yeah. So it'll be after the election. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so that'll make it better, uh, I'm sure. And there'll <laughs> be more continuing resolutions on the way through because they can't 
they can't be bothered to do things in the, in a normal rational reasonable normal order as that goes they can't they can't pass the 12 budget bills a year that they're supposed to be passing they have to just keep putting it on increasing the debt and saying it'll all be fine but i mean it, it, anybody who's run a household budget understands that it's not going to be fine right brad i mean that we just you can look at it and go that's not going to work forever well that's the point of of the uh... Committee for Responsible Federal Budgets uh, uh, recent report. It was, look, it gets worse. You think it's bad now. It gets worse uh, uh, under both Trump and Harris. In fact, it gets more worse uh, under Trump because of all the revenue reduction measures. In terms of current paying as you go, it gets worse uh, uh, under Trump uh, because of all the all of the reduction in the revenue measures. So, yeah, it's it's yes, it's bad. Yes, it's bad. Interest costs are going up as as interest rates have gone up. Interest on the national debt uh, is going up and sinking it deeper and deeper. But it gets worse under either of the two candidates that we have before us in November. And we're continuing now with Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, the weekly top three. We're up to number three, and we're talking about, uh, Brad wanted to talk about the, the hot races, the races that seem to matter in both the Kenai and the Fairbanks area, Brad, I'll I'll give it over to you, my friend. Well, I want to I want to talk a little bit about what's going on in those races. Not so much, not so much, you know, picking out those as the hot races, but but sort of the evolution that's going on uh, going on in some of those races. I I was I was I've particularly focused on what's been going on in the Kenai. Uh, Bob Bird, uh, well known. Uh, uh, radio uh, uh, broadcaster and other things down on the Kenai, uh, wrote an op-ed in Must Read uh, that I thought was eye-opening. It, it, Bob Bird essentially gave Jesse Bjorkman his start, Senator Jesse Bjorkman his start by letting him co-host uh, uh, the radio program that, uh, that Bob Bird had. And, uh, and by keeping him on the air, essentially gave Jesse a platform to sort of grow his profile uh, first into a seat on the assembly and then and then on uh, Kenai Assembly, and then on uh, Borough Assembly, and then on uh, uh, and then on, and then to the Senate. Um, and 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 Bird, you know, describes all of that history about how he gave Bjorkman the start, and why he gave Bjorkman the start, and why he thought Bjorkman was the right person. And then he just and then he just sort of turns around and he says, "I'm sorry," <laughs> and explains explains that Bjorkman has not lived up. To the expectations that Bird had for him, that he's disappointed him in a number of ways, um, and that he and that York and that Bird is uh, endorsing uh, Ben Carpenter uh, in the Senate race, and it's sort of like you know I I gave this guy to you, I gave him a platform, I promoted him, uh, and I'm just sorry I did that because because he's not turned out to be the guy I thought he was. He's not turned out to push the positions I thought he would. He's turned out not to you know stand for the things that I thought he'd stand for. Um, and I'm endorsing Ben Carpenter. I've, I've made a mistake, and I'm fessing up to it. And I'm endorsing Ben Carpenter. I thought that was I thought that was a remarkable uh, uh, op-ed uh, to write in the middle of a, an election came, campaign, particularly uh, from somebody who, uh, who who gave Bjorkman his start. Well, it was really detailed too. I mean, he he basically lays down all the parts where he has become disappointed, where the changes have made, and I thought that was pretty eye-opening. I agree with you. I think it was eye-opening to see the changes that went through. Yeah. And, and it's really, I mean, it's sort of the, sort of the, this is why, I, what I thought the guy was going to do. This is why I thought the guy was worth support. And this is where I was wrong. And, and, and we shouldn't keep going down this road. He's just turned out to be, not to be what, uh, what I, what I thought he was. And then in, in one of the Kenai uh, uh, legislative races, uh, there was, there's been some interesting stuff going on, uh, which I think is good. Uh, although if you believe it, there's an article in the Clarion that talks about um, uh, the Ruffridge Gillum race, uh, and the headline of it is from this week. The headline of it is Ruffridge Gillum talks school funding, natural gas pipeline, and state finance at Forum. And here's here's what I what what really the, the paragraphs that that you know opened my eyes. Ruffridge said he wanted to see the creation of a fiscal plan prioritized in the next legislative ses session, specifically. He wants to see the dividend enshrined in the Constitution, implement a spending cap and budget cuts, particularly government positions that have gone unfulfilled. The state, Rufford said, also needs more revenue. 
if he said more, he's wrong. He should have said substitute, but but nonetheless, reference said also needs more revenue. Potential options include a sales tax and income tax or, or quote, my personal favorite, increased revenue from resource development. All of those changes should be in one bill, he said, rather than separate pieces. That's a change. I, at least from my perspective, it's a change for uh, for Ruffridge to uh, to be saying that. Essentially, it's the Ben Carpenter fiscal plan uh, that Ruffridge is now endorsing um, and also speaking up in favor of, he should say, substitute revenue sources instead of more, but speaking up in front of, uh, in, in speaking up for uh, substitute res revenue sources. I will say this, when he said, my personal favorite increased revenue from resource development the only way you're going to get that, Justin, is uh, is through uh, modifying or, or, or revamping oil taxes, because over the next ten years, the Department of Revenue tells us that while revenue or while production goes up fifty percent, goes from the four hundreds to the six hundreds, revenues stay flat. So if you're gonna if you're gonna if you're true to your word and want more revenue from resource development, then you need to go in and and modernize, modify, modernize uh, the oil taxes to take into account the problems that have showed up after 10 years of, S of SB 21 um, and, and revamp oil taxes in a way that gives Alaskans, gets for Alaskans, the additional revenue from those additional volumes. Because on the track we're on now, more volumes doesn't mean more revenue. More volumes just means more volumes, more profits in the, in the, in the, in the pockets of the oil companies and their shareholders outside. It doesn't mean more revenues to the state. It just holds uh, state revenues even. Uh, I'm not sure he recognizes that, but but when he says that, my personal favorite increased revenue from resource development, that's the way you're going to have to get it because it's not coming. It's not going to come natural naturally through increased production. In any event, I just thought I thought Ruffridge's comments there were just eye opening. Now the question is, can you trust him? Do you believe right. he'll when he gets to Juno, he'll really do that? Right. Uh, or is he just saying that to sort of to sort of make it through uh, this election cycle? But but that's that's Ben's plan. I mean, what he just outlined. Uh, well, and plan. that's what struck me about this. This piece is that he's saying that. And I'm thinking, didn't you look to see what happened last session? This is exactly what Ben was working on. I mean, did you not? What if this is the plan you wanted and this is the fiscal policy working group plan that Ben has been trying to push? Why didn't you? I mean, why didn't you why weren't you supporting it then if all of a sudden you found it now you just found jesus now i mean come on what you know it, it, this is exactly what ben's been talking about for the last two years why now all of a sudden to me that was the kind of the shocking eye opener that's why like you said do you believe it well i don't know this is the same thing that's been going on for two years why wouldn't he have supported it then yeah, and Ruffridge, Ruffridge was on house finance uh, uh the last uh, the last two years the last uh, session and I don't recall him saying much uh, about advocating Ben's fiscal plan that was down in Ways and Means about bringing it up and and making it all fit together uh, and putting it uh, putting it on the floor. Um, you know, he had the opportunity when he's on House Finance, he has the opportunity to say exactly that and to work toward exactly that. But I don't recall uh, a whole lot of a whole lot of uh, comments from him uh, in in support of, of, of anything like. Uh, what he's saying, uh, what he said in the debate. So I, I find it interesting in that district in particular, because that's the other half of Jesse Bjorkman's district. So you now have the the incumbent representative on one side, Ben Carpenter pushing for that proposal. You now have the, the representative on the other side uh, saying, essentially saying that's a good proposal. And, and so Bjorkman, you know, maybe that means both uh, halves of Bjorkman's district is uh, is shifting out from underneath him. That'd be good, uh, but I just find it particularly interesting that uh, that Ruffridge uh, said that. And uh, you know, following up on Bob Bird, I think it's a further should be a further nail in the coffin of uh, of, of Bjorkman. One other one other uh, uh, article caught my attention uh, uh, during the week. This was up in Fairbanks, uh, and it was uh, the articles in the Fairbanks new, News Miner. It was reporting on Senate candidates field questions at chamber at chamber forum. It was about uh, the 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 forum included Senate candidates from both sides, both Senate districts up there, uh, both the one currently held by Scott Kawasaki and the one formerly held by Cliff Bishop. That's now uh, that's now an open seat that Mike Kronka is uh, is running for. 
And, and there were a number of questions that were raised during the forum that are covered in the article, uh, energy retirement plan, the defined benefits plan, ballot measure one, and then out migration. And, and on out migration, the question was, what do you think Alaska can do about out migration? What are the, what are the responses that Alaska should take for out migration? And all of the comments, according to the article, all the comments were finding ways for government to step in and lower costs, for, for government to play a role to reduce costs for energy, reduce costs for childcare, reduce costs for this, reduce costs for that through government programs. None of them, and I and this includes Hajukovic and or, and, uh, and Kronk, none of them said, how about letting middle and lower income Alaska families, the working Alaska families that are the ones leading the out migration, how about letting them keep a little bit more of their money by reducing the tax rate of PFD cuts and spreading the burden more equitably across, across all Alaska families, non-residents uh, and, the, and the old companies. Spread it broadly as Ben has talked about uh, with his sales tax. How about that? And allowing middle and lower income Alaska families to keep more in their pockets. The ones that are leaving allow them to, to keep uh, keep a little bit more in their pockets. If you want to spend, spend, but 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 make sure the burden's broad so everybody contributes equitably towards it. None, none, including the two Republicans, none of them uh, talked about that. It was it was just this government program or that government program or that government program. And I find that hugely disappointing. Um, at least down in the Kenai, Refridge is talking about yes, we need uh, we need a fix the PFD by constitutional amendment, and we need uh, we need to, to replacement uh, revenues uh, from some other source, a more equitable source. At least they're talking about that. Up in Fairbanks, they're just talking, even the Republicans are talking about more government programs. And that is, that's not good. That's not good. It's, a, it's disappointing to say the least, I think is the, yeah, because I mean, that should have been, that should have been an easy walk on question right there. <laughs> You should have been able to just say, well, if we just gave people a little bit more of their PFD, maybe they'd be, you want to lower their cost of living or you want to give them a little bit more to stay here. That would have been to do it, especially as you said, when you've looked at this and seen that, that this is the, uh, that that is the group of people that is leaving Alaska the fastest. You think that would be the way to do it. It's almost like people have just kind of given up on the PFD in some ways, Brad. That's what it feels like anyway. It feels like they've just kind of given up on the PFD. And that is the most disheartening thing, I think. I think Brian just said disheartening. I think that's probably the accurate statement there to see that this is where they're at. I think they've just been, I think they've just been conditioned, even the Republicans up in Fairbanks, I think they've just been conditioned to, oh, there's a problem. I'm running for office. I'm supposed to solve the problem through more government. Um, and I think that's just, I think that's just the Alaska way that's, that's, that's developed over time. I'm not sure. I'm not sure you can, I mean, the effect is NIPFD. And if you would have asked them a different, a different way, do you think that the PFD ought to be protected? I suspect all of them would have said something along the lines of yes, but I just think they think, you know, th that I'm running for office. I'm supposed to have solutions as opposed to creating the opportunity for people to have their own solutions. I'm supposed to have the solutions and I'm supposed to use money or take money or, or grab money um, uh, in a way that that allows me to you know be the hero and 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 create those solutions I think that's just the conditioning they've had Republicans you would think uh, would would be more inclined to say oh I think people ought to have more resources to, to develop those problems themselves and sometimes they say that in the K through 12 context because they talk about vouchers and they talk about people being able to but with their feet and have the have the resources to be able to do that. But when it comes to when it comes to, you know, solutions to problems, it seems to be the Alaska way, even among Republicans up there, at least in that race, uh, seems to be just uh, just more government spending as opposed to more resources in the hands of the people. It's very frustrating to watch. And uh, yeah, uh, Kevin says that people uh, he said, people have give, totally given up on the PFD, very little pro PFD communication from constituents in the last two years. And I don't know if they just feel like it's a losing battle, like we're never going to get it back. Uh, I mean, this is again, this is what Hammond was trying to avoid. He knew that this is what was coming and he was trying to avoid it. And 
we did for 40 years, but it, to this point, it's just, it's become nearly impossible to, uh, to separate it out. Part of the problem with that, Michael, is that legislators by and large are not leaders on the issue. They're, they're just, they're followers on the issue and they've fallen into the trap of, of, oh, we need more money to fund government, to keep it balanced. And so I'm just going to take it from the PFD. Um, ben is an exception to that. Ben has said, no, uh, here's a proposal on how we stop that and how we broaden the base and how we reduce the burden on Alaska families. Um, and and I think I think he's provided leadership on it. And I think he's getting a response uh, down in the Kenai uh, because of that. Agnes Morin in uh, in House District one, the candidate down House, House District one has done the same thing. She said, we need to do this a different way. We need to stop taking it through the PFD. We need to broaden the base and and take the burden off of middle and lower income Alaska families. I think I think people if to the extent they're given up, giving up, I think they're giving up because there's a lack of leadership on it. Dunleavy, Dunleavy certainly hasn't provided any leadership on it, but Ben has. And I think Ben shows that legislators, individual leaders, legislators can stand up and provide leadership on it. They don't need to wait for people who are just sort of exhausted by the process to come in and complain about it. They can see what's right and wrong they can see what the right economic step is for the state, the right economic step is for middle and lower income Alaska families, working Alaska families, and they provide leadership on it. Legislators who are sitting there and waiting on, and, and, and only responding when the phone rings on the issue and waiting for people to come to them, I think are part of the problem. Ben is part of the solution. Ben and others who are willing to step up and be leaders on the issue and say, look, this is wrong. I, I don't care if my phone hasn't rung in the last five minutes on it. This is wrong. This hurts the Alaska economy. This hurts Alaska families. Legislators who are willing to be leaders on it, I think, are, are, are the solution. Those who just sit back and wait for the phone to ring and, and as people get exhausted by the issue, don't call uh, anymore and say, well, it must not be an issue because people aren't calling. Um, I, think, I, think that's the that, I think they are the problem instead of, instead of, uh, instead of being part of the solution. It's definitely frustrating, and we can see, again, the way people see, even <laughs> Harold said, the Alaskan way, I thought it was rugged and independent instead of welfare queens. So you think the PFD is welfare? Is that is that what you, because again, that's the way a lot of people are treating it. That's the way a lot of Republicans are treating it. Like this is a government pay payment or subsidy, or it's not the people's money, it's the government's money, and it is a welfare program. I've had people who I respect tell me that uh, in the Republican Party, and I'm like, well, how can you, did you not read how it was set up and why it was done? This is just more government lucre. This is them raiding the money from the people. I mean, I just don't understand. The people who are telling you that I would bet are largely in the top 20% and largely, you know, don't see the PFD as, as significant to them. Don't see the return of their share, of a share of the state's commonwealth as significant to them. I, I would guess they're not in the middle and lower income Alaska brackets uh, who do see the PFD as as significant to them and who do see that as a, a, that, that the PFD cuts are taxes. on right. them. They just don't think they can do anything about it because they don't have legislators standing up for them. Right. Well, it's frustrating. Final thoughts, Brad, here, less than 60 seconds. Well, we're what, two weeks away from the from the election? Uh, uh, it's probably, uh, we're probably at the point where people are, or have made up their minds or are making up their minds. Um, I think it's, I think it's important to look at what your candidates are saying about economic issues and to respond to that. I think it's important to support candidates who are stepping up like Ben Carpenter and being leaders on economic issues, not waiting for the phone to ring, but being leaders on economic issues and, and coming up with proposals that are more equitable for Alaska families to support those type, those type of candidates. All right, Brad. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate it. Thank you for coming on board. We'll talk with you again next week. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Appreciate you coming out. Well, that's a wrap on another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.